This edition of the Riddler Report is brought to you by LRN.FM. Feds don't want you to hear them. Well, to paraphrase Tom Clancy, the world is now in what we could call a malleable moment. That is an advantage for authorities, but it can also be an advantage for people like you and me, uh, pro-freedom people, who tend to oppose all the politicians in authority. So not only can negative change occur quickly, so can the opposite. Who'd have thought you'd have a right to hide your identity while out and about in public with a mask? Who'd have thought that... Uh, people would be getting released from jail in large numbers, although I'm not, I haven't actually checked the numbers, so I don't know what this is, but there's definitely a move in that direction and a motivation to get those jails as emptied as possible. This could start looking like Sweden before long, where they sort of emptied their jails out a long time ago. At least we can hope. But other things are happening that aren't so positive. It seems like people are not really gaming things out. You know, they're not thinking ahead as to how this is going to look in a month or in two weeks. I'm glad they got some toilet paper. It was my dream to live in a neighborhood that had plenty of toilet paper. For the first time in my life, I do. But people imagine that things are just the way they are right now. And they'll stay that way. You know, there, for instance, there was someone I, I told someone on talk radio that I had opened a trading post uh, and really it was I'd actually at that point it was just a uh, I was just leaving sort of free items out by the curb basically uh, some free tissue paper free paper towels not a whole lot and you know he just was aghast that I would do that he said if I saw something like that by a curbside I'd be afraid to touch it I would never go anywhere near it <laughs> Fortunately, my neighbors feel differently, and they've been gradually taking advantage by taking one or two items at a time. But that guy's not thinking out in the future. He says, well, the stores are still open. Well, yes, they're open today. What if they're not open uh, uh, two weeks from now because of additional crackdowns of some kind? What if uh, things go south in ways that we're not expecting? People are acting as though there's nothing going on except for COVID. Did anyone notice that the nuclear clock is now at 30 seconds to midnight, the closest it's ever been? The other mistake people are making is they're not taking a look at what's going on in other places and assuming that, oh, that's probably uh, something that could happen here later. You know, so for if you would think about China, you know, we can look, China and Italy both tell us a little bit about what the future uh, would look like. In China, of course, the coronavirus seems to have been somewhat cowed by uh, their crackdown. And in Italy, too, the numbers of deaths, you know, peaked initially and then went back down. They see the numbers seem to be going back down in New York. So that's an indication that there will be a brief peak here, too, and then the numbers will go down. However, we can also see that British Columbia, I think, or one of the Canadian provinces, has apparently banned uh, selling a can of food unless you're a store. You can't resell it. Of course, that's something that could trigger starvation if this thing goes far enough south. If you take away the motivation for a person to sell a can of food to their neighbor, and they're also per, per, you know, uh, limited from traveling to their stores... How is that going to work? We have to game out the possibility that that might happen here in New Hampshire, too, even if this all goes as, as expected, which it won't, probably. There'll be all these unexpected things that happen. The problems that are just being ignored will bite people while they're not looking for them. So not very many people seem to be talking about gardening and the importance of being able to produce something. Uh, for me, what I've done is started a dandelion garden because I'm a crappy farmer and dandelions are great for crappy farmers. It's, you know, I, I try to kill them and it doesn't work, so I, I guess that'll work for me. Uh, um, but... Uh, I had some dandelion seeds. I thought this might happen, uh, you know, something along these lines where there could be a, a crisis interrupting supplies. 
And I figure, well, I should just... I've been, I've been collecting dandelion seeds for two years, and I still don't have enough, but I've got a few. And so I've started a dandelion garden. Uh, plus, of course, my trading post and my neighborhood newspaper that you can see, you know, so you can see those in action in the videos that I'm doing. So no need to talk about that much. But what else did I do? I reached out to everyone whose contact information I had here in town uh, with the goal of establishing trade that will be useful a month or two from now or in fall when this thing comes back around uh, after the uh, probable summer lull and hits America again. If history's any indication, that's how it worked out in the Spanish flu. The first round was not that bad. It was the second round that was really deadly, I think, or maybe the third one. Uh, I've been doing a good quarantine-y type thing for myself because uh, I had a sore throat for part of this. And uh, I, I, that worries me in a sense. You know, I, I worry that people will be so quarantined and so protected from germs that their immune systems will start getting weak, weaker. I don't, I'm not a... I'm not a doctor, so I, I can't say for sure, but I just have this bad feeling about too much cleanliness. Uh, and, uh, <clears throat> you know, I'm wondering if it may be appropriate at some point to get exposed to this thing under ideal conditions, which is not right now, uh, because they don't understand it well enough. But six months from now or three months from now, they're going to have a they have a pretty good handle on this thing and an idea of how to treat it and an idea of how much exposure is required for you to to get infected and i wonder if it's better i mean if you're gonna if we're all gonna get exposed to this sooner or later anyway i wonder if it's possibly better to get exposed uh... under controlled conditions and that would be probably before the vaccine comes out because that's going to be so long from now we're looking at a year or so from now that's going to be too late to be of much use who knows whether you can trust it I would not get exposed to this thing on purpose without uh, consulting a lot of people and thinking long and hard about it. But, you know, there's there's this thing they call the uh, super forecasting phenomenon, and that is that nowadays forecasting has become a science, and, and people understand how futurism works. If you want to predict the future, certain things work, certain things don't. And the main thing that doesn't work is being a specialist. If you're a specialist... Uh, without a whole lot of general interests, and you're trying to make predictions, especially about the field you're a specialist in, it it tends to go badly. Uh, the best example is this guy. I think his name is McKibben. I can't remember. I think it's Bill McKibben. He's like the the climate alarmist uh, who who uh, has got all. Well, no, maybe he's a no. He's a population alarmist, right? He was a population. Eh, oh, maybe that's not Bill McKibben. Anyway, there's some guy who was a population alarmist at some point in time you have the 60s 70s population time bomb all that guff uh and uh you know every every prediction proven wrong because what he was a population specialist that's why you you do better if you are a generalist a bright person who has a wide range of interests and uh, better yet a group of bright people that work well together and have different sets of eclectic interests that apparently is the best type of entity for making a prediction and uh, so that's why it's so dangerous to have a doctor in charge of uh the united states economic policy to some extent right this doctor guy is getting to make economic decisions well that guy's going to have blinders on he's only going to be thinking about one thing probably and that's doctoring and keeping people from getting some doctor thingy <clears throat> when he's not going to he's not going to be thinking about warfare he's not going to be thinking about economy and how to keep people uh happy and prosperous so that they're not shooting each other that's going to be the last thing on his mind so we'd we'd be better off with uh with uh, you know a super forecasting group in charge of medicine of american medicine than that guy probably uh and, and everybody, it seems like everybody in authority has is, is just got these blinders on. It's the exact opposite situation from 1917, uh, except it's also the exact same situation. Because, you know, they had the blinders on about Germany. We've got to kill Germany. We've got to pretend there's no flu. Uh, now it's the exact opposite thing. We've got we to gotta defeat the flu. We've got to pretend there's no risk of war. 
But wars are what happen when you stop people from trading, when you have depressions, when you have goods failing to cross borders. That's what leads to armies and computer viruses uh, crossing them. Weaponized, state-level computer viruses. And this is all happening at a point in time where people are looking at China and saying, hmm, they've done pretty well. You know, after the first initial screw-ups, they've actually handled COVID pretty well. Now, they haven't handled rights very well, uh, but they have actually uh, banged down the disease, apparently. So there's going to be this tendency in Western societies to want to further imitate China. Hopefully they will remember that the reason China is currently great is because of its freedoms, not because of its totalitarianisms. It's the economic freedom that they, that they believe in so strongly now, or, you know, compared to what they used to, that is what has made China work. And those are precisely the freedoms that are being most interfered with right now in the United States. What else is going to happen? Well, maybe I shouldn't be playing futurist, uh, since I'm not that much of a generalist. I'm somewhere between a specialist and a generalist, but I do have a lot of interests and I don't have a dog in every fight. I do think it's important to listen to, you know, all these authori well, some of these authoritarians, the ones I can stand that are smart enough to actually be stood for a half an hour of listening. And I'm listening. I'm hearing out the mainstream press. I'm hearing out the the uh, the bright thinkers who are authoritarians. And I'm hearing out Free Talk Live every night, the most uh, effective uh, voice uh, for um, for liberty and the one that will uh, tell you what's going on probably better than any other that I know of without a lot of conspiracy theories and without sucking the government's dick. So what I would expect and assume will happen is a baby boom. It's probably already started in the United States and it will probably happen all around the world. There will be a second baby boom. Everybody's locked in their house. What else are they going to do? This is how this works in Sweden, right? And those kids will be growing up in an environment, a germophobic environment. That is very dangerous for kids. They're supposed to be putting stuff in their mouth and playing around in the barn and getting, you know, dirt uh, all over them and in their mouth. And that's how kids program their immune system. So we're going to have this whole generation of immune weaklings. Uh, that's most likely, and, you know, I'm not talking about my field here. I'm not talking about medicine. So, uh, since talking about your own field is where you get it wrong, maybe I'm getting it right. But a good thing that may be happening is that, uh, you know, maybe the dinosaurs, some of them are getting wiped out and opening up new business opportunities for mice. I mean, I feel like there's this gap that I need to try and fill a little bit in my neighborhood. There's some people that are having some trouble getting some things. And though that's not going to create a lot of demand for a little neighborhood yard sale or whatnot, uh, it does make those things much more important than they were before. So whether I enjoy it or not, it turns out I do, I'm setting up that kind of stuff. I mean, is it likely that anyone's going to really have to rebuild civilization starting from their curbside trading post? Probably not. But why not go through the motions and see how it all works? Something else I've noticed is this uh, concept, I, I call it the activist honey trap for liberty activists. People want to sort of jump straight into the idea of disobeying these, these rules against assembly. Uh, so they say you can't have more than 10 people gathered in the same spot, supposedly, in New Hampshire. Uh, and so liberty activists, in some cases, have gone straight ahead and done that anyway and written the government, told them they're doing it, doing more or less textbook civil disobedience. Uh, now, normally that's fine, it's good, but you just don't want to be too knee-jerky about that sort of thing. Uh, it is possible, as George Orwell used to say, to hold... In one's head, two facts simultaneously. 
on the one hand, the fact that the government can't be trusted, and on the other hand, the probability that this virus actually is pretty dangerous and is pretty contagious person to person by air. There is also a history. If you look at, uh, again, the Spanish flu, uh, which I really should be calling it the, uh, the federal flu, it's a really a more accurate name for it since the federal government essentially created it on accident by gathering troops too close together in makeshift barracks at Kansas. That's basically where the thing started. Anyway, they turned to what was, you know, just the flu at first into a flu that can kill you in 30 seconds. Thank you, federal government. But anyway, um, in this pandemic, there were some things that worked better than other things. Uh, and the thing that seems to have worked least badly was what they did in San Francisco, which I would not have done and would not do now because it's not ethical. But they did the China thing, right? They, they locked the place down. They shot people for not wearing masks. And they, uh, they just did, they did most of the things that are kind of being done now in the most locked down of places. And it worked. So, you know, don't trust headlines, trust history. If that's how this played out before, and if lockdowns worked before, then that means that against COVID, they'll probably work again. It's, these are viruses in both cases. So, while it would be unwise to shoot someone for not having a mask and while you don't want government fixing all these problems at taxpayer expense, that doesn't mean you want to go out and assemble at close range. You should be doing as much as you can to prevent the spread of the thing, but also as much as you can to prevent all the other types of death that might happen and all the other types of badness that might happen, right? And much of, most of those come from the government. So we should be fighting them, uh, but doing it, we fight them smart, uh, you know, and peaceably. We, we don't want to, we don't want to pull a, uh, I, I call it the 1940 Yugoslavia uh, uh, move, where uh, they decided, well, we need to defend every border in Yugoslavia against the Nazis. With only four weeks' notice, that should work out well. No, they they should have either taken the, the army straight to Bosnia, which was defendable, or taken it straight to Albania, where they could have attacked the Italian army and at least thrown the, uh, the axis out of whack. You, you don't have to defend every border. You don't have to disobey every order. We can do this smart. Now, for me, the line I've drawn is, you know, the one that says I can't hold a sign by myself on a street corner. When we get to that point, then I do that civil disobedience. And I've already done it and no one cared <laughs> except the newspapers, which actually covered it. And then, uh, <clears throat> you know, the other thing is if, the, if the, you know, the, if they order you, you can't, you're not allowed to have trade in your neighborhood. Well, that, that's another one that I would, I would disobey. Uh, and I'd try to do textbook civil disobedience, you know, where you inform the government you're going to do it and what day and you call the media out and bring them along. That's the response to this. I mean, that's one response. There's probably other stuff we could do that's better. At some point, they're going to get to a the spot where they have pushed too far. They have uh, they have started to, to ban something that everyone knows is harmless uh, and everyone supports. And you can act with the public on your side. This is Liberty folks time to shine in New Hampshire, or it will be very shortly when the government has pushed too far. Kind of like that moment in World War One where, uh, you know, G uh, uh, General Foch was able to see, he was able to perceive in disaster, uh, the opportunity to win the war suddenly and unexpectedly, right? So this French general sees Germany, um, Wiping out his front lines, wiping out the British trenches, pushing, you know, what is it, what was it, 10 miles in a day? I mean, astounding numbers by World War I standards. Uh, at this point in time where everybody thought Germany was in, you know, within days or weeks of winning the war, Foch just builds up a reserve force and he waits for the Germans to overextend. And that's when he hits them. So there'll be a point where the government has done something that is perfect, perfect to disobey en masse and create our New Hampshire spring. Or at least 
we can hope it plays out that way. And we can be ready. By the way, completely different topic, even though it's the same. <laughs> you can have a lot of different topics that are all COVID, right? Uh, completely different topic under the same heading. What exactly is an essential business? And how the F-bomb would we ever want the government to be the one making that decision. How essential do they think it is, by the way, to demonstrate against the government? I bet they think it's not very essential. When you're supposed to have essential, you're supposed to be on essential business when you leave your home. They don't, they, yeah, they don't think that uh, demonstrating the street corner is essential, do they? Uh, I need to read the order closer in New Hampshire, but I actually, to their credit, one of the orders, I think in New, New Jersey, uh, indicated that leaving your home for political purposes was protected. Uh, and I thought that was uh, that was neat. I'm glad that was in there. I bet it won't be protected for very long. Heck, it didn't even seem very protected last year. But it is interesting that we're, we're this deep into this crisis, and you really you haven't actually seen very many reports of major abuses uh, you know, like governments killing people like they did during the during the Spanish flu. Uh, although I, you know, I just may have missed it. I'm just I'm surprised I'm not seeing more. And as uh, the days go by, I think we will be seeing more. We will see, be seeing people uh, killed by the government to help protect them from COVID. We we already had to worry about this stuff that's been going on with science, with the science being corrupted by government funding. And, uh, you know, the, the quelling of alternate viewpoints, you saw what happened to the guy who had the absolutely correct theory, probably, of uh, dinosaurs being wiped out by a meteorite or asteroid. Uh, you, you know, you saw how he was silenced and, and you, you saw how, um, at least partially silenced, you've seen what's been happening to Graham Hancock, the journalist. Again, he's not a scientist, and that's why he's possibly so right about his science. You see how he uh, he gets uh, censored practically off of TED and YouTube because he's uh, you know he's got this theory that there was a great civilization existing in in the world eleven thousand years ago, and and the more time that goes by, the more he seems to be vindicated, and the mainstream Egyptologists are proven uh, to be. Uh, the censorship mongers. You got to got to see this video sometime where uh, Hancock is uh, preparing a slide presentation, and this main, this huge, hugely important Egyptologist just loses his s bomb because Graham Hancock showed a picture of someone he didn't like. He says, "Do, do not talk to me. Do not talk to me, Mister Hancock. Do not stay away from me. Do not talk to me." <laughs> it's, it's insane. It's batshit. It says more about how accurate Graham must be uh, than anything else I've ever seen. But anyway, we already had that problem. Now that problem is being applied to COVID as the scientists who we cannot trust. I, I mean, we, we can trust science, but we cannot trust these people who are like government funded scientists or their agenda scientists or their censorship scientists. We can't trust them. And they're the ones who are in charge of this whole COVID thing. Not the generalists who actually understand the world, not the super groups, the super forecasters, uh, groups of generalists who have a track record of being right about what to do, but specialist scientists. It's like we have the worst, the worst combination of confirmation bias and religious science. Science with all the all the uh, crappy human tendencies that can come with a religion uh, married to alleged credibility. This is why Free Talk Live was probably taken off the uh, Well, That's what the, the station manager said. That's why they were taken off the air. Uh, well, we've got the crisis right now. There's COVID scared. Uh, t government towing government line not need to. <clears throat> waving my dick around, kicking you off the air. You know, uh, that's... That's just, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a small thing compared to what was done to Galileo, but it's the same thing. And why are the media outlets talking about numbers of COVID deaths without talking about the numbers of overall deaths? 
the numbers of deaths being caused by government, the suicides that are up, uh, the number of flu deaths. Where's the perspective here? I've never seen anyone report it, except maybe Free Talk Live, and I don't even think I got a whole lot in the way of numbers from them. Numbers are everything, boys and girls. They're the pure science. By the way, another good thing that has come from this crisis, or a good thing that has come from it, is a renewed uh, focus on the Libertarian Party of New Hampshire. Although they're not really very effective, it never hurts to have the word libertarian out there. Uh, what they're doing is they are requesting, so they've brought up the importance of the fact that uh, this crisis has made it impossible for them to get on ballots. And this is another reminder of just how bad the U.S. electoral system is. You know, libertarians have to collect a bunch of signatures to get on a ballot, when Republicans and Democrats just get it handed to them on a platter. So they're saying uh, in a news release, quote, at least the fact at least they're releasing news releases, how many libertarian parties even do that? Quote, the Libertarian Party of New Hampshire has sent a letter to the New Hampshire Secretary of State, Bill Gartner, requesting ballot access relief due to the spread of COVID-19. The Libertarian Party of New Hampshire has consistently been able to collect the 3,000 valid signatures it takes for unrecognized parties to achieve ballot access for their slate of candidates. Given the medical consensus that individuals should remain six feet away from others, a guideline known as social distancing, the party feels it would be a risk to public health to collect petitions. The LPNH Executive Committee said in its letter to Secretary Gardner, subquote, the Libertarian Party of New Hampshire has been petitioning throughout the state since the beginning of January, in subquote, in order to collect the petitions required, and as the risk of COVID-19 grows, halted ballot access efforts effective immediately to protect voters, activists, and those who will eventually handle these petitions in municipal offices throughout the state. Of the request, LPNH share Brian Shields said, with election deadlines fast approaching and with so much fear and uncertainty concerning this virus, it is vital that the Secretary of State and Governor act to protect our elections by waiving the petition requirement. The Libertarian Party of New Hampshire is New Hampshire's third largest political party. For more general info, please visit lpnh.org. Unquote. All right. For more counterintuitive, offbeat ideas that you never hear anywhere else, stay tuned. I got more in my head than I can get out these days. Ridley out. RidleyReport.com. I don't like Freedom Radio Talk. Listening to LRN FM makes me balk. Far from it, I should probably walk. LRN.FM. Feds don't want you to hear them.